consider the renunciations of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. They are well known in their general outline. They have been since she was so famous for so many years. Her outer life was well known all around the world. What was not known and is only now in the recent years and even this year especially becoming much better known is the interior renunciation. We could say perhaps the unprecedented interior renunciations she was called to make. Let's consider the, the renunciations that, she, that we know that she made. Uh, some of them were more or less typical. Uh, as a young woman, she renounced her father and mother. That is to say, she left her family. She renounced the right to be a wife and a mother and entered religious life. She became a religious sister. Uh, a very significant renunciations for the rest of her life. And they bore fruit with her work as a, as a teacher in India. She was quite, uh, did good work, was very successful, ex respected. But then came this uh, new renunciation to renounce all that and set off in, to serve the poorest of the poor. Initially, all by herself, but with the idea of forming an order, a new order from scratch, and against unprecedented, un, 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 indescribable obstacles. Think of just that, that renunciation when she, she cut the cord to her order and stepped out into the streets by herself. But now we're coming to know the interior renunciations that accompanied that journey, in which Mother Teresa, we could say, perhaps renounced or was called to renounce the experience of God's presence for his absence. This is becoming known because the letters that Mother Teresa wrote over a period of 60 years to her spiritual directors are, about to, are being published. Maybe you saw the story, the cover story of Time magazine, the picture of Mother Teresa, and it says, the secret life of Mother Teresa. Now, how does that strike you? When you hear something like that these days, you think, aha, someone has uh, rummaged around in these documents and, and found out that she was really a fraud. You know, this person we've all admired, uh, the secret life is phony. That's what we tend to think these days. But uh, this uh, book, which is being published this, uh, very soon, Come Be My Light, it consists of these letters, and it's being published by the church, by the priest in charge of her process of canonization, as evidence of her deeper sanctity. And these letters are being published against Mother Teresa's express wishes. She made it clear that she, she asked that her letters all be destroyed, but they were not. And it may redound to the spiritual welfare of millions of people that we still have them. And so to think a bit about this renunciation of Mother Teresa in light of the gospel that we've just heard, we could need to start, I think, with <clears throat> her experience of Christ's presence, particularly at the beginning of her work in the Missionaries of Charity. In 1947, when she made this now famous train trip in India, and as she described it later, it's as if Jesus was sitting right next to her. His presence was palpable, and he spoke to her and told her, you are, I know, the most incapable person, but just because you are that, I want to use you for my glory. Come, he said, come carry me into the holes of the poor. Come be my light. Come be my light to the poor. And Jesus said this to her. And so as a result of that train trip, she began the laborious task of separating herself from her order and forming a new order, uh, being the servant of the, of, the, of the poorest of the poor and the rest is history. But what, as I said, what was not history until now is that from 1947, when she began to 1997, when she died a half a century, 50 years, Jesus for her was the absent one, the absent one, with one brief hiatus about 10 years later of several weeks duration. Most of that 50 years for her, Jesus was absent, 
in her heart. That's the experience she had. And she speaks of that in these letters. There is such terrible darkness within me as if everything was dead. I call, I cling, I want, and there is no one to answer, no one on whom I can cling. When I try to raise my thoughts to heaven, there is such convicting emptiness that these very thoughts return like sharp knives and hurt my very soul. And I'm only selecting some of her remarks about her experience. This painful, uh, just ter torturing experience of the absence of the God she loved so much. And she sought desperately to seek counsel and to find how to deal with this. And in 1961, she encountered a very wise spiritual director who gave her what proved to be saving advice. Father Joseph Nooner told her three things. First, there is no human remedy for, your, for this experience of emptiness. The, what that means is, what that meant was, it's you are not to blame. It's not your fault. Despite what it feels like, you are not to blame for this. There's no human remedy. Secondly, he told her that her feelings are, do not say anything about the reality of the presence of God or the absence of God. As in, in, con, in, in continuity with Catholic spiritual tradition, our feelings are never, never a basic guide to our spiritual state. We cannot trust our feelings alone. We have to take note of them, but they cannot be the ultimate deciding factor. And thirdly, he said to her, the very craving she had for God's presence, this intense desire to be in union with God, that itself was the surest sign of his presence. And so Mother Teresa took this very much to heart, and it seems to have been a turning point in her life, because she wrote in 1961, in the wake of this advice, I have come to love the darkness, to love the darkness, for I believe now that it is part of a very small part of Jesus' darkness and pain on earth. The eclipse of the sun at Calvary, the abandonment by the Father on the cross. Saint Miss Mother Teresa saw this now, this experience of hers as intimately united with that of Jesus. Jesus, she said, can't go anymore through the agony, but he wants to go through it in me, in me. Think of what Jesus says at the end of the St. Matthew's Gospel, I will be with you all days. I will be with you all days, even to the end of the world. Every one of those days, I expect somewhere in the world, someone, and many in fact, are going through the dark uh, experience of Mother Teresa. Which of us has not had this sense of being abandoned by God? Some people have it a lot, as we see from her. But Jesus is with us all days, even to the end of the world. And could he not have used her experience as a, as a confirmation to us of the truth of that promise? I will be with you even in the darkness and the agony of your spiritual anguish and abandonment. She, Mother Teresa, realizing this association with the crucifixion and the death of our Lord, went on to say, I accept, not in my feelings, but with my will, the will of God. I accept his will. And then she spoke to Jesus directly in her writing and said, if this brings you glory, if souls are brought to you, with joy I accept all to the end of my life. With joy, I accept this anguish and darkness as long as you may ask it of me. And from what we know, that offering was accepted because she's experienced this darkness till she died in 1997. 